Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 10, Text 1, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Translation. Sri Sukadeva Goswami said, In the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are ten divisions of statements regarding the following the creation of the universe, sub creation, planetary systems, protection by the large, the creative impetus. The change of manus, the science of God, returning home back to Godhead, liberation, and the summum bonum. There is no purport to this verse, which may be surprising. But there is some verse too. Dashamasya Vishuddhartang Navana Mehalakshanam Varnayanti Mahatmana Shutein Artena Chanjasa To isolate the transcendence of the Samam Bonam, the symptoms of the rest are described sometimes by Vedic inference, sometimes by direct explanation, and sometimes by summary explanations given by the great sages is also not purport to this although in the 11th canto there are similar descriptions with purpose text 3 to which there is a purpose bhuta ma trendriya dhyam janma saga udahutaha brahmano guna vaishamya disaga the elementary creation of 16 items of matter, namely the five elements, fire, water, land, air, and sky. Sound, form, taste, smell, touch, and the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, and mind is known as sarga, whereas subsequent resultant interaction of the modes of material nature is called visarga, apart. In order to explain the ten divisional symptoms of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are seven continuous verses. The first of these under reference pertains to the sixteen elementary manifestations of earth, water, etc., with material ego composed of material ele intelligence and mind. The subsequent creation is a result of the reactions of the above-mentioned sixteen energies of the first Purush, the Mahavishnu incarnation of Govinda, as later explained by Brahma in his treatise, Brahma Sanghita, as follows. Yah kararana bhajale bhajati sma yoga nidrama nanta jagaranda swaroma kupa adhara shakti mavalamda parang swamurting govindam adi purusham tamaham bhajami. The first Purush incarnation of Govinda, Lord Krishna, known as the Mahavishnu goes in, into a yoga nidra mystic sleep and the innumerable universes are situated in potency and each and every hair hole of his transcendental body. As mentioned in the previous verse, Shutena, or with reference to the Vedic conclusions. The creation is made possible from the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly by manifestation of his particular energies. Without such a Vedic reference, the creation appears to be a product of material nature. This conclusion comes from a power fund of knowledge. From Vedic reference, it is concluded that the origin of all energies, namely internal, external, and marginal, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as explained herein before, the illusory conclusion is that creation is made by the inert material nature. The Vedic conclusion is transcendental light, whereas the non-Vedic conclusion is material darkness. The internal potency of the Supreme Lord is identical with the Supreme Lord, and the external potency is enlivened in contact with the internal potency. The parts and parcels of the internal potency which react in contact with the external potency are called the marginal potency or the living entities. Thus, the original creation is directly from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or Param Brahman, and the secondary creation as a reactionary result of the original ingredients is made by Brahma. 
Thus the activities of the whole universe are started. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Yilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Dhrameha Shri Taitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Jena Bhrutale Swam Rupa Kadama Hyam Dadati Svapadantikam Vandayam Shri Dharo Shri Atapvara Kamalam Shri Guru Navaishnavamsa Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahadana Raghuntam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Tetam Nadevam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahadana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamsa He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatipate Kobisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Taptakan Chanagorangi Radhe Vinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpata Rubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyagacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Tetanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare This chapter is titled Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. It is a bold assertion. How many atoms are in this room? In this tent. Did anyone say, does this mean you didn't read Srimad Bhagavatam? You should, if you read Bhagavatam, you should have the answer to all questions. But we don't have the answer to that question. So all questions means proper questions. Shotavyadini Rajendra Nirang Santi Sahasrasha Apashyatam Atmatatam Griheshu Grihame Dinam Persons who are blind to knowledge of the self have many subject matters for discussion in human society. So Prabhupada in the purport discusses how the whole world is full of questions and answers but on the wrong subject. Once in Venezuela, Caracas, I believe it was, Prabhupada met with a group of philosophers, theosophists, or something they call themselves, metaphysicists, metaphysicists, the members of some metaphysical society. So, what was the question they were asking? They were asking the question, what? What is the, they were, they were bringing up the, the, what to them was the important question, like, does God exist? And Bob said, that's not the real question. The real question is, what is the source of everything? So even the, the people are asking so many questions, they don't know what's the proper, they don't even know what is the proper question to ask. Now we should inquire into the absolute truth, and that is first defined as Janmadhyasya Yataha, the absolute truth is the source of all emanations. Sarga, Visarga. Poshana, maintenance, and nirodha, uh, destruction. Srishti, stiti, palai. So, as Prabhupada states at the beginning, or even before beginning his commentary on Bhagavatam in, in the introduction, that the concept of God and the concept of the absolute truth are not on the same level. There tends to be a, there tend to be a, a class of philosophers who consider the absolute truth as impersonal and a class of sentimentalists it's generally considered by the philosophers who who believe in God although there's no philosoph there's no philosophical or empiric evidence for the existence of God but they just believe in him, as Prabhupada within one paragraph brings the two points together, that the Bhagavatam brings together these two concepts, the concepts of the absolute truth and God, or even this term God, Prabhupada, 
didn't use it so much. He liked to use the term God, supreme personality of Godhead. This term Godhead was, it's an English word, but not much in use, even among theists. But Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he liked to use that word Godhead to distinguish Krishna from the concept of God in the English language, which is Christian concept, in which they perceive they perceive God as the creator and order supplier in the language of Bhaktisthan Sasra Thakur for the as the supplier of fuel for the fire of their sensual desires. Order supply, Prabhupada said in more simple language. So a vague concept. Creation, he's the creator, and he supplies what we desire for our sense gratification. However, Bhagavatam as the answer to all questions gives more knowledge. This uh, Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam, it is the science of the knowledge of God, and we can see in this second canto, third canto, particularly this, this uh, very scientific presentation. One purport in the third canto, Prabhupada says that this verse can be the basis of much scientific research, and Prabhupada actually wanted that. He took up the challenge of modern science, which uh, until fairly recently, probably Krishna Shaysworth would be correct me on this, but the, until fairly recently the, the Christian church had to a large extent capitulated to the scientific challenge. The, the Catholic church incorporated the uh, evolutionary theory into its doctrine. They said, well, it's a, they didn't really explain why, but they never really explained how God was the creator, but they said that it can be, a, it's acceptable, then God becomes the cosmic button pusher who starts it all. Actually, that uh, that would fit, that could fit with the Bhagavatam theory, not in the way that, Bhagavatam theory or Bhagavatam explanation, not in the way that uh, modern science say, but it's an elaborate description of the creation. And it's difficult to understand, isn't it? We find it difficult to understand. We, we hear about all the one element comes from another element, and, and then from one part of the body of the universe or form, a different element is manifest. It's not easy to understand. Just like modern science, it's not easy to understand. How many, do you have any atomic physicists in this room? No? Well, it's not surprising. <laughs> oh, actually, that's true. Yeah, she said she told me she was coming. She, she's still down the hill, looking through the telescope. If you came up here, you might see better. You're a little closer to the heaven. <laughs> Most of it's mathematics. It's not looking through telescopes. Anyway, these subjects are not easy to understand. We've heard that Professor Einstein, the greatest person of the 20th century, according to Time Magazine's readers, he was in many ways a lonely man because he couldn't find anyone to talk with about what he had to talk with. And the only people who understood his theory did disagree with him anyway. So he was a lonely man because he had such technical knowledge. So this is technical knowledge. It's difficult for us to understand, but Prabhupada, he wanted some scientific research into these topics. He wanted Bhaktivedanta, so he was very much concerned with this, that our devotees, they would overturn the present paradigms of, as Prabhupada called it, so-called science, by presenting knowledge of the Bhagavatam. Now, most scientists wouldn't even begin to look at Bhagavatam. 
it's, it, it appears to them to be some dogmatism. So it's a difficult task. But Prabhupada wanted that because he could see that the mundane science, or, or the particularly the science that had developed in uh, in pursuance of Darwin, the founder of the evolutionary theory, that had given an, a basis for a wholly atheistic society. And even though the church may say, the Catholic church may say that, well, we can accept evolutionary theory, but the scientists say, well, you can accept it if you like, but we don't need you. Maybe you need science, but we don't need God, because our theory... You need science to convince your people that, that yes, God is the original scientist, but we don't need God to... We have our scientific theories. However, there is at present time, at the present time, a, a counter-movement to this, particularly in America, it seems to have become very prominent, uh, of people who want creationism or that there is a creator of the universe or, or that the universe co comes into being by creation, by design, not by chance. So this movement has become so prominent in America, even the President of the United States is a supporter of this, that it should be at least taught as a as a parallel theory. If, that evolutionary, or, or the theory that evolutionary theory is one stage, that's like Sarga Visarga, that, that, that the universe came into being by chance, which is at present taught as a fact, that should be taught as a theory, and that creation, that came into being as uh, by creation, that should also be taught as a possible theory. At least that much they want. And that it's taught as a, as a fact. I've seen that they have these popular science books, and they write that so many billions of years ago, there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was uh, a, a singularity, which is a wonderful scientific explanation. It's not, a, it's not an explanation at all. It simply means chance. There was nothing, and then Within the nothing, the singularity means a, like that, single, it, unique. It just, all of a sudden, with no explanation, no reason, there, there was a singularity. It was, and it was so small, but it had all the mass of the universe in it, and then it exploded. Big Bang. And then we have the universe. And they, they'll give, they'll explain like this, although there's absolutely no evidence. It's just a theory. But they explain as if it's a fact. And they're very much against the dogmatist, dogmatic ideas that there is a creator. Although their idea, it's also dogmatism. It's not the only theory of the origin of the universe. There are other theories also. There's also a theory that there is no origin. It's just always there. That's also there in supposedly Vedic philosophy. But uh, the most popular theory at the present time is Big Bang. When we say popular theory, Big Bang, we say popular theory, it immediately means it's not science. <laughs> but they present it as, as science, as fact, which Prabhupada, at that time, now there are many to say, but at that time there was no one else to say, this is cheating, Prabhupada pointed out, this is cheating. Now there are many to point out that this is cheating, that they're, they're teaching it as science, whereas science means there should be uh, examination, deliberation, hypothesis, ex experimentation, and then you come up with what is accepted as proof. But Prabhupada says they simply look at something and then they talk all nonsense. So, uh, there is, there is a, an increasing discontent, even in scientific circles, with at least with evolutionary theory. Uh, Prabhupada he said that we should distribute hundreds of thousands of these books, meaning his books, not the scientist books, the real scientist books, real scientific books. Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. And Prabhupada said that will have a tremendous effect on the mass populace of Europe and America. So he may say, well, 
we've distributed hundreds of thousands of books and what ha where is the mass effect what happened Prabhupada didn't say that hundreds and thousands of people would shave their heads and put on dhotis and ladies would put on saris he didn't say this but he said it would have a tremendous effect exactly the words I'm not remembering remember that one said a letter tremendous impact something like this well uh, there's your effect that uh, just recently there was uh, this 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 there, there was a this president Bush was bringing up this uh, point about teaching creationism in schools he was supporting it publicly although later by you know, politicians are good at that they say well actually we didn't exactly mean that and they can say one thing at an, one time and then just twist it a little bit just it depends who you're talking to you have to be popular with everyone so you can get the votes uh, anyway he was supporting that and then a whole big discussion came up uh, in the press and uh, it came out that there is a society of scientists who are against evolutionary theory. They they say that it's 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 hollow, it's shallow. And there are four hundred people who have four hundred scientists who have signed a statement. To date, there are four hundred who have signed a statement saying that present evolutionary theory does not. It's totally insufficient to explain life as we perceive it on this planet. And these are not you know, just uh, high school scientists. These are real scientists. These are PhDs and uh, Nobel. Nobel. Is there some Nobel Prize? I think there were two there. You saw that email also that came about this? And uh, there are 400 of them, of which 70 are biologists, and more than half of them signed last year. So, and they said they're expecting more. It's, it's that's quite a lot if you consider. There are not that many real science. I mean, real up there scientists in the world. So it's catching on. Uh, I, may, we sitting here may hypothesize. That this is a re this is a direct result of the push that's come from the book written by or the books written by Sadapuja and Drutakama Prabhus, which scientifically and with massive evidence. I mean, it's such a. I mean, did you ever look at that book? The, I mean, uh, who can read through it? It's like it's boring, like everything, <laughs> because it's because it's full of facts and figures. I mean, who wants to read so many facts and figures about? skulls dug up at this depth in the earth and this is and this earth is shown to be so many hundreds and thousands of years old and I mean it's boring but the, the net result of it is it's dynamic and it's having its impact and Dutta Karma Prabhu has taken that book and with that one point he's traveling all over the world and addressing scientific circles and having an effect and, and the TV programs and radio programs and there's no one to refute it because it's true. Uh, and w when it first came out there were some great reviews from the orthodox scientific community when once they printed that also that it's pure bunkum and only someone with uh, only someone with, with absolutely no scientific ability would accept that and uh, what can we do it by 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 evolution by what's the word by natural selection some people are born so stupid or something like this but but he had nothing to refute it he had only what's that called hype uh, what's it called there's a, there's a term for that there's uh, I can't remember you should know that it's ad hominem arguments just yeah you're wrong because you're wrong and that proves you're wrong. <laughs> like that <laughs> I said so and he said so also and he also said so that proves you're wrong but it's it's not scientific so uh, it's having its effect Prabhupada wanted this that devotees they take up this challenge and in those days we couldn't imagine but it's it's got together and um, 
it's it's really having its effect. There are other. I mean, there is this creationism movement, but um, due to karma, especially Sadaputa is not propagating it so much. But due to karma, Prabhu, who interestingly is not a scientist by training or profession. Um, he's taken this up and he's taking it all over the world and he's presenting it in a scientific manner, not a religious manner. This, um, what, what the, the objections to these scientists is that they, why you're scientists, why are you taking up this religious stand? But the scientists who are protesting against evolutionary theories are we're not taking it up on a religious stand, we're just taking it up on science. If you, by science, if we study science, then evolutionary theory doesn't fit. So they're taking it up on a... Uh, Dutta Kamakuk is taking it up. He's taking up many different scientific issues, just like you saw in Back to God in magazine. It was described about... Uh, he gave uh, a lecture on the concept of time in uh, Vedic understanding that he, he pointed out that modern science in the Western world has a linear concept of time, that, that everything came into being at one point, and then eventually, at least when I was at school, that's what they told us, it may be a different theory nowadays, that at some point of time, the earth would fall into the sun, and then everything would be burned up, which, again... We have the, the Vedic version, which suggests something similar. There'll be, there'll be burning, not just of this little planet, but of the, the whole the whole universe will burn for thousands of years, and then it'll rain and it'll be filled up like this. So anyway, they have a, an idea that the universe will come to an end at some point in time. But Dutta Kamprabhu is pointing out that this idea that there's a beginning of the universe and an end, and then... There's, you have to, maybe there'll be another singularity, everything will become nothing. I don't know if they ever explained this, but Druta Kamar pointed, pointed out that this, this is borrowed from the Christian concept, that God created everything at one point in time, and at one point in time, uh, there will be a day of judgment, and then it'll be all over. And those who are bathed in the blood of Jesus will go, and they can go on taking baths in the blood of Jesus for time forever to be and those who don't will burn in hell forever there's no redemption from hell so you ever got taught oh you didn't get taught at this school because you were from the socialist background that's what i was taught at school nowadays apparently they don't teach them. And not only that but you had to be a catholic if you're a protestant then you went and you still had to go to hell so pretty fearsome theology. Uh, fear inspiring. So, uh, Dutta Kamrabhu is pointing out that rather there is, and, and that also gives the idea that the soul, the soul is born along with the body, identification of the body with the soul, so that when Jesus comes back, then the body gets revived. I saw a, a pamphlet given by Mormons in which they were saying, they were describing their idea that, well, you go to heaven and you remain there with your family. But I was thinking that, well, if you're there with your family in heaven, then you will want to be young with your children and have your father and grandfather and grandmother and grandmother but your grandmother she'll want to be young with her grandmother so what happens it's uh, theology based on the bodily concept of life that we are this body and the body is revived and the, we go on enjoying this body as one archbishop of canterbury was asked what will you, what will you what do you want to do when you go to heaven? Presuming he was going to heaven, and he said, "I'll spend the first hundred years enjoy, uh, sorry, glorifying God, and the rest of eternity enjoying myself." 
<laughs> yeah. There is. With God's blessing. I can't remember. No, it's quite a long time ago. I read this about 15 years, 20 years ago. There have probably been a few archbishops in Canterbury since then because they appoint them when they're old and they go off. And I think maybe they have to, I'm not sure, maybe they have to wait for the day of judgment before they even go. I'm not sure. Then uh, there was another English. That's the Church of England. Well, that's what I said, because they presumed he's going to heaven. They presumed he's going to heaven. Now, another English, the reputed English theologian, C.S. Lewis, he wrote a series of books, which I read in my childhood. It's a series of books for children, but it actually has a theological import. That uh, the first book was called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But anyway, it's a long story, and I don't remember it exactly. It's merciful. It's probably there somewhere inside. In which, in the, the end of the book, the conclusion is that they all go to heaven. And what's heaven like? Just like England. <laughs> he said, I think they said, except there's no winter. The sun is bad enough. So this is called a bodily concept of life. So in which God is imagined to be one who blesses us to enjoy as we consider enjoyment to be, it to be at the present time. So, the Bhagavad concept, Godhead, uh, where Godhead is not there, but the, the definition of the, the different terms, Ishvara, Bhagavan, in here the subject is given Ashraya, the Samam Bonam, the Supreme Absolute Truth in Western philosophical terms. That upon which everything depends. A person. What's the word for person? Oh, Seva. Someone that. Oh, Seva. Seba. 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 Oh, Bengali. Bengali. <laughs> Seba. Seva, yeah, that, the whole idea. We are to serve Him. We are parts and parcels of Him meant to serve Him. We are not the body. The body is an encumbrance, a burden. It is. It is an illusion to think that the body is for us to enjoy. Bhagavatam, generally we're recommended to read after going through the Bhagavad Gita, which is the summary of all, or the essence of all the Upanishads, Vedanta. So Bhagavatam is expanded Vedanta philosophy. So from Vedanta we understand we are not the body, we are Brahma, we are spiritual. And in Bhagavad Gita we have Krishna described as Param Brahma, the Supreme Spirit, Param Dhamma, Avitram Paramam Bhavan, Bhavan, you, you are a person. So this point of Godhead, the idea of God as a person is there in Christian theology, but who is he? How does he interact with this world? What is our position in relationship to him? This sambandha gyan is give or a knowledge of our relate. Who is God? What is our relationship with him? Is particularly given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Not even in other parts of the Vedic literature. Not so clearly given. Bhagavatam is very clear. <coughs> Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. Beginning with Atra Sarga, beginning with creation, Visarga, the, the, our concept of God is as the creator, because we can see this world and we tend to, from our vantage point, from our perspective, we tend to perceive of it, of this world as our position, our present position, we tend to conceive it. This is, here we are. 
And when we hear of the spiritual world, then it may sound difficult for us to understand. Even Prabhupada often says that it's difficult for us. Difficult. They don't ask so many questions about the spiritual world. When we go, we can see. So, God is just, that's true, He's the Creator, but He's much, much more than the Creator of this material world. Just like if you go to some rich man, you don't have so many rich people in this, in this country because of the communism. They didn't have, or, or they didn't show, but if you go to some rich man's estate, they have a big, big, their house is set on a large estate, and a huge house, very nice, a very nicely architecturally designed. So if you come there, then there's an outhouse. Do you know what an outhouse is? It literally means that. It means the toilet, which is out, it's separate. There's an English word, outhouse. That means they also used to have. Now it's all attached bathrooms. But previously they used to keep it at a distance. So if someone visits this estate and he goes to the outhouse and he sees, it's actually very nicely built. And, uh, and go like this or you just press a button and it flushes. Even today there are many people who have never seen such a thing. We take it for granted. And then you start praising. Oh, this is wonderful. What a wonderful outer. And it has heating and running water. And uh, one of those things, I can't remember the name you use. You have another thing with water for cleaning your backside when you're finished. And it's, oh, this is really wonderful. Whoever made this? And you start, you go on and on and on. Oh, it's so wonderful. And you don't think there's a huge opulent palace just next door. And you think, oh, this, this man's really great. He owns this outhouse and he created it. And, whew, what a great person. But they don't have any knowledge of the, that the outhouse is only an outhouse for his servants. And he has the big, big palace, which is with marble and crystal chandeliers and gold and pearls. And, but we're hung up on the outhouse. So like that, if we think that if we limit our understanding of God to being the creator, when the material world is just like the outhouse. It's a place for rejected. Those who are rejected from the spiritual world, those who have ejected themselves from the spiritual world, it's a very limited understanding of God. So Godhead means the supreme personality of Godhead, who is the creator, remote creator. Parasi shakti vivithaiva shruyate. What's the beginning of that verse? That tells me. What's the beginning of that? Anyone know? I can't remember. Swabhaviki jnana bala kriya cha. That, uh, I thought Shamas cha, that he cast tradition to me. The Tasya cha hung, uh, anyway. The Upanishadic verse says that he has unlimited potencies which all work by his, simply by automatically, not even that he's running around desperately trying to check that all the buttons are running and all the machinery is in order, but the whole uh, cosmic manifestation runs on simply by his desire. And even he's not directly, maybe directly and indirectly he's conscious, but he's, he's not concerned. That, He's not directly concerned. He has his agents to open. He has his energies who manifest and maintain and control and ultimately destroy the whole material creation. It's not Krishna's direct uh, concern. Or he has his own world, spiritual world. And that spiritual world, it is different in quality to that of this material world, which is that spiritual world is Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge, whereas this material world is Asat, Achit, Nirananda. Satchit Ananda means eternally existing, full of knowledge and full of bliss, whereas in this material world is called Asat, Achit, Nirananda. There is some existence, and there is a sense of eternity. We, we feel, I am this body, but it's, I'm, I'm living. 
we identify our, our whole identification with this body, but we have a, of a sense of I-ness, that I am eternal, but it doesn't fit with the body. That that it, sense of eternality comes to an end with the end of the body. We, everything we see, that's why people, they, they may be shocked, they, they come back to their home village where they lived, and they didn't come back, and after 20 years they come back, and all the things they expected to see, the tree they, they played under when they were a child, and the well, and it's all gone, and there's a there's a big factory there instead, and they become shocked, and oh, how horrible, it, it shocks them, because they presume that, that this this is how things are, they were, and they always will be, but it's not, everything's subject to, to change, and, so, and we have knowledge in this material world, but it's, the knowledge we have is actually not knowledge, because it's, it's based on the illusion of considering uh, Krishna, everything not in directly, everything considered not in relationship to Krishna as being factual. This is given in the beginning of Bhagavatam. Tejo Bari Madang Yata Vinimeo Yatra Trisanga. Everything in this material world appears to be factual, but it's it's not factual, just like a mirage. You know that word, mirage? Yeah, same thing, same word in your language. So, mirage, it means just like on a hot day, or on the road, you'll see some water up ahead. So, but there's no water there. It just appears to be so. So, is the mirage real or not real? It's real, and the, the perception of... of of something is there, but it's not what we take it to be. So, and Ananda, there's, there is Ananda in this material world, there is happiness. But that happiness is only a drop, whereas we need an ocean. And it's also, within that drop, there's cyanide also. It, it's, the happiness is mixed with a large admixture of distress. So, to project or to consider this, the, the uh, psychologists say that the, the, the idea of God and the spiritual world is a, project, a projection of what we presently perceive, but actually it's around the other way. This material world is a, it's a perverted reflection of the spiritual world, not that the spiritual world is a manifestation of what we perceive here and what we desire here. So what is the difference? What is the intrinsic difference? In the spiritual world, there are trees, people, houses, family, friends, rivers, animals, breeze, seasons, day, night. All these things are there and here also. What's the difference? The difference here is that everything is limited by time and space and there's no concept of service to Krishna. That's, that makes the difference. That for on this plane, we see everything as an object for my enjoyment. But in the spiritual world, everything is perceived as an object for Krishna's enjoyment. In this material world, everyone tries to make themselves the center, which doesn't work, because center can only be one. Whereas in the spiritual world, everyone recognizes Krishna as the center, and so everything becomes concentric. Okay. <clears throat> so, transferal from the material world to the spiritual world is made possible. One can see the spiritual world even within this world by developing, in the words of Bhakti Sramsasvatthaka, Golok Darshan. Means seeing everything as meant for Krishna's pleasure, including myself. He is not meant for my pleasure. He is not created. This, this misunderstanding that the material world is created, God created this world for us to enjoy. This uh, 
mundane theology. That yes, there is God, but He has created this world is all in all, and there may be a heaven, but that will be. We'll go to heaven and it'll be just like England or Slovenia if you happen to be in Slovenia. Janani Janma Bhum is Jaswargam Eva Gaviya In material consciousness, we consider that my mother and my motherland are more praiseworthy than heaven itself. So this concept that God has created the world for us to enjoy leads to horrible conclusions. Such as, the animals are there, why did God go? They have no soul, they must be there for us to enjoy. So it is, it is our religious duty to kill the animals and eat them, because if we don't, what will happen? There will be too many cows, and they'll overpopulate the earth. <laughs> if we don't kill all the chickens, then there will be chickens everywhere. <laughs> So we're doing, we're doing good service to human society, society by killing them and eating them. You shouldn't be misled by all this bad propaganda, sinful propaganda to be a vegetarian. Once I came out of a temple in central London to be confronted by a Christian who was preaching with leaflets, he was giving out leaflets to all the misdirected souls who were entering the Hare Krishna temple. He had a leaflet with a picture of Satan with horns and fangs coming out of his mouth. And he was holding a plate on which there were very sinful items. Beware. There were carrots, potatoes, <laughs> apples, cabbages. He was warning, don't be misled by this vegetarianism. Because if you're a true follower of the Bible, you have to accept that God gave man dominion over the animals. Which means we should eat them. As Prabhupada pointed out, it's just like someone, you are, you you uh, ask that I'm, I'm, I'm going away for two hours, can you please look after my child? Say, okay, and come back and say, where's my child? I looked after him. <laughs> I love children. Boiled, roasted, fried. <laughs> so it's a horrible idea that you're given charge of someone and then you eat them. So, Srimad Bhagavatam gives scientific knowledge. I didn't give very much scientific knowledge in this class. Maybe some hint of it. How Prabhupada actually wanted us to study these books very deeply, and especially devotees of scientific capacity to refute the modern ideas of Big Bang and evolutionary theory, as, which are the substratum or foundation, basis of the modern demoniac society. Because people think, well, everything just came into being by chance. That means there's no God. Therefore, there's no point in religion. Therefore, what's left? Eat, sleep, drink, be merry, and enjoy. For tomorrow we shall all be there. Kinanyat kama haitukam. Jagadahuran Ishwaram. Asatyama pratishtam te jagadahuran Ishwaram. Aparaspara sambhutam kinanyat kama haitukam. This Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, it's not something new that the scientists have dreamed up. It's a, it's a standard demoniac stance that there is no actual truth or, or substantial reality, substantive reality. There is no basis of existence. 
There is no supreme controller or God behind the universe. Everything has come into being by chance. Aparaspara sambhuta means everything has come into being by chance. There's no related, uh, not that the cosmos as we see it is come into being by uh, any cause, ultimate cause with us. Yeah, that's it. But just, it just is, that's all. There's no cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And then we go about sarva karana karana. The ultimate cause is Krishna. And therefore, kim amyat karma hitu. Then what else? What is there? What is there to do but enjoy life and indulge in lust? <coughs> so how are we to understand then the ultimate creator through Bhagavatam, through Shastra? And immediately our scientific friends, as we say euphemistically, just like one politician will say, my, my friend from such and such a state, meaning his political enemy. So our scientific friends, they say we cannot accept scripture, it's just written by a man. It's just someone's theory, someone's idea. What is the proof? Of course, logically, if, if we consider logically, if we see so much order within... Science means the study of order. If there's no order, if there are no laws, then where's the science? It, 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 science is to study the uh, interactions of cause and effect. So that the universe is so much ordered suggests very strongly suggests that there is a design behind it. There is a, or at least some purpose. There must be some purpose behind it all. Just like if you in, invent a machine and it has so many pulleys and lights flashing on and off and you show it at, the, at, at, at an inventor's exhibition, they come and look and say, well, it looks very good. It's press the button and it moves this way and that way and trap door opens and it closes again and looks very impressive. What does it do? What's it for? What's its purpose? It doesn't have any purpose, it's just a machine. So I invented it. Why, why do that? Why, why would you make a machine that doesn't do anything? Machines are invented because there's a purpose, because there's a need. Someone invented the electric toothbrush because he perceived there was a need for having electric toothbrushes. I couldn't exactly work out what that one is. But, or someone invented the combine harvester. Got that? Okay. Because they thought, well, if you have a combine harvester, we can have one man sitting inside it, and we don't have to employ 20 men. And it'll do the work very efficiently. And the, the men can go to the city and work in the factory building the combine harvester. So, when, the, when some need is perceived, then a machine is made. Well, this is the advancement of science and technology. When they, there used to be a 64K limit for RAM in computers. And they broke the barrier. I don't know, it was even called RAM at that time. Anyway, and they saw if we, if we could just break this, we could have computers with megabytes and gigabytes. And it was a, they, they were stunted in their development and then they worked out how to do it. I don't know how. I don't even know what RAM means. Actually. Some of them. They, they, there's some perceived need and then they invent. So if we see in the whole universe there's so much purpose, or there's, there's so much order, then we, we should logically conclude that there's a purpose. As Einstein himself said, I don't believe that God's playing dice with the universe. So, in other words, he suggests there should be some purpose. So if there's a purpose and a designer which we can 
logically deduce, we can't prove it, but we can logically <coughs> deduce, then the fact that we have a desire to find out what's going on in the universe suggests that the designer also communicates with us and lets us know. And that's a that's why that's how we can accept that there should be some scripture, someone should know. Someone should be able to communicate with us. But from the from the not anthropomorphic, anthropocentric, or from the, the man-centered stance. We can't see God. But we have the scriptures. We can see God through scripture. So Prabhupada very much wanted there would be scientific research to show how the Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. And actually a few years ago, Rasaraj Prabhu brought one of uh, a well-known name, Rasaraj is in Bhaktivedanta Institute, so he brought a well-known name in modern physics, Dr. Henry Stepp. He is a well-known name because I was going through a book on popular science and his name was there. For some of his theory came up twice in the book. So he brought a well-known scientist to Bombay, scientist to Bombay, and had him sit down and he, he sat down for three months and wrote a uh, in scientific terms, how about the creation as described in Bhagavatam can be described in scientific terms. I can't tell about what he wrote, but he did it. Which means that some progress is being made. It is possible. And it is possible that uh, scientists, I mean, these are real scientists, it's not a pop scientists. The real scientists can take up the uh, Bhagavatam. And, of course, Stapp, he wrote it not as a, he didn't write it as a scientific fact, but he wrote how it, he wrote how it could be explained in scientific terms as another theory. So, there is a lot of work to do. I guess most of us in this room won't be doing it, but that is an, in, <laughs> that is an important area of Prabhupada's mission. Prabhupada spoke so much about this and so much wanted this that, uh, that modern science is making a big bluff by taking its present atheistic stance and that modern science can be brought to perfection if it simply accepts that there is a supreme cause of our causes. For which purpose they will have to come to the Bhagavatam to find out who is that cause of all causes. Because logically or scientifically we can accept that there is God, but then who is he? What does he do? What is his personality? Just like we can logically conclude, we, I don't know the name of the president or prime minister of this country, or even that there is one. Whether he's a, what kind of governmental system you have, but I can presume that there is such a person, head of state, right? President? What's his name? Something I can't even pronounce. I could, but I have to practice. So, there is a president, that there is a president we can conclude, but what his name is, what does he eat for breakfast? What does he like to do? Any idea? Better not tell us, it's Bhagavad. Anyway, he has his personal preferences. How does he dress, presumably in suit and tie? When he's at home, what is he dressing? Some jeans, probably, or some t-shirt, some floppy hat like this, maybe. But I don't know. He's a vegetarian. How about that? Okay, what does he like for breakfast? He was really sick. I was very sick, and then he became a vegetarian. All right, anyway, the point is that there is a person at the head of the administration. But there is an administration and the person at the head of it, we can, con we can logically, uh, we can deduce or presume that what he is, what he does, what, what's his personal life, who's his wife, who's his girlfriend, and all this kind of thing. That we cannot logically conclude. We have to find out from someone who knows him. And if he's a big enough shot, or, then someone will write a biography. And we can find out what he likes to eat for breakfast, 
all this kind of thing. So logically we can, or scientifically, we should deduce that there is God, there is a creator, but not this, this material, not just of this material world, that's not his all in all. He has the spiritual world, that's his place, where things are set up according to his desire, which are not, not exactly like England. But what does he do there? What does he look like? What does he eat? Who are his friends? Who, who are his girlfriends? All this kind of thing. That you cannot, that's a personal choice. So that we have to find out from those who know. That's given in scripture. So science, scientists, they, if they can accept this Bhagavatam knowledge of the creation by design, by the, then for further knowledge of who is that designer, then they should come to Bhagavatam to find out who is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the creator and much, 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 much more than the creator of this outhouse of the material world. He is, uh, the, the Vedic definition doesn't stress so much on Natasya Kayam Kalanam Chadidyate, line I forgot. They don't, don't but Rasovai Saha. He is the res he is Rasa, he is the reservoir of all loving exchanges. So that these scientists have to understand. A, a popular science book I was reading maybe ten years ago. They were talking about how in science scientists many scientists are gradually beginning to can't be that many because the status quo is still highly atheistic. But uh, many scientists are gradually coming to understand through the impasse in science, and they haven't made any real progress for the last more than 80 years. They, they got to quantum theory and stopped. So uh, many are starting to look for a metaphysical solution to belief in God. So there's so many quotes in that book from scientists. And uh, the one I remember after reading the whole book was that uh, that after so many years, this, the, the scientists and the theologians, they had a quarrel. And the theologians went off, and the scientists went off on their own tack, and they started climbing the mountain of knowledge. And after, after one point, they they got up with classical physics and then they came up with this theory and then they ascended another rock and they came up another theory and then they just dragged themselves up to the peak to find the theologians waiting for them. <laughs> Said one scientist. So that's a great task of this Bhagavatam knowledge. Of course we can read Krishna book as Prabhupada has been saying for those who are not hung up on atheism, they can immediately come to appreciate Krishna. But the, 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 the world is going on in the schools, what's taught, and the, the general intellectual ethos is, is one of, uh, it's governed by this atheistic scientific outlook. So. Robert wanted these books distributed very widely in hundreds and thousands so that they have a tremendous impact on the masses of people. In, in Robert said in Europe and America, you know, especially stress. So, anyway, I think I'm long enough now. I guess we'll finish the class. Here. The conclusion should be that we should distribute these books in hundreds and thousands in Slovenia. We have to have the books first, right? We don't have any. We only have the first canto. The first two cantos. I believe Prabhupada said, especially these first two cantos. He wanted all the cantos, but especially these first two cantos. He wanted widely distributed among the masses. Life comes from You have life comes from what? Okay, that's a very important book. That's revelatory to so many people. So many people have said that reading this book changed my whole outlook.
At that time, it was really revolutionary because no one was saying such things. Although nowadays, they're probably because of distributing Prabhupada's books, there is widespread distrust of, of science and scientists. Here's an interesting thing. I, this, this class is my, my exploration of Kami literature. So, so uh, I happened to see on the plane, uh, this is a newspaper, and it was re referring to the uh, people who live in Chechina, which means, what do they call Chechina or something? Chechis? <laughs> Whatever they're called. So the, the reporter was saying that anyway, everyone knows that traditionally they're all rascals. <laughs> Written in English. In English, but I don't read any other European language. They're using the word rascal. And then later on, in the, as, as I was flipping through the newspaper, I saw the word nonsense being used. And I thought, that's interesting because these words, at the time Prabhupada was using them, they were already somewhat, or the usage that Prabhupada uses, is somewhat archaic. Archaic, you know that word, it means outdated. Rascal, still in India, if you use the word rascal, it's a very heavy term, because Indian English is stuck in the 19th century. <laughs> but it's, it's, a very, it, it's a very heavy term, but in modern English, it's become... It's become almost like an endearing term. Endearing means a term of affection. Or you'll call your child, oh, you rascal. And it means you did something wrong, but you like it. Or nonsense in the way Prabhupada uses it. It's, it's also, it's become a much lighter term in modern English. It, or it had become, but it seems from this usage in the newspaper that it was used in a way that I'd never seen, except in Prabhupada's books. Means someone's reading Prabhupada's books and they're, and they're adopting that usage again. The, the, it's there are many signs actually that Prabhupada's books are having so much effect on the masses in Europe and America. So please print them, and distribute them, and read them, and live by them. And live by them means. Ultimately, to go back home, back to Godhead. Beyond this sarga, visarga, sthanam, poshanam, these are all subjects of the material world. Of course, this can also be applied to the spiritual world. That's another big subject. And I'm closing the book. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Srimad Bhagavatam Gita. And I think we better finish there because we have to go on. We have a quite a program today. In the morning we'll all run down to Ljubljana and have another program. So Hare Krishna. Any question? Comment? Protest? Yes. Uh, what is not situation in India? Is there in the India the scientists? In India are the scientists um, atheistic? Well we have the IRA in India. You've heard of the IRA? Irish Republican Army. <laughs> they also have the Indian Rationalist Association. <laughs> Another IRA. <laughs> Scientists in India, um, well, those who speak about these issues, those who are vocal on these issues, are mostly along the IRA standard. Or, or anti, or anti religion. But there are many. As I discuss uh, Sada Puta Prabhu, who I you've all heard his name, Sada Puta, yeah. you should know about him. So the last time I met him, which was quite a few years ago in India, we were discussing this point, and he said, from from his understanding, most Hindus have two compartments in their thought processes. One is the day-to-day, -day scientifically oriented one, and the other is for when they go to the temple or see a sadhu. And they turn this side off and turn the religious side on. And they, they don't put the two together because if they, they did, the whole thing would short circuit. Because they have the ability to turn on and turn off. Once I was on, on a 
train ride. No, not many times I was on train rides. But once on a train ride, I was with a teacher of biology or something, something scientific at, at a university. And uh, I happen to have life comes from life with me. Happen means I've taken for distribution. So I discussed with him for quite some time. And he was from Orissa, which means in Orissa, at least the Hindus and mostly the Muslims and, and uh, Christians also, they all have deep faith in Jagannath. Although they, it's not, they don't have any knowledge of philosophy or any such thing. But as soon as you cro you've crossed the border from Bengal or Andhra or anywhere else into Orissa, what's the first thing you see? Everywhere Jagannath. Everywhere pictures, deities, everywhere Jagannath, Jagannath, Jagannath. Everything. Jagannath. Great attachment to Jagannath. Maybe less so in this far south. They're, they're, they're more into Nishimha. And in the there are shantas, plenty of shantas, but they all, they all, everyone loves Jagannath. So I said to him, I said, you're a biology student. So I said, you, you, where are you from? So he told me, he was going to Orissa. I was, I was going from Hara to Galatia, the Darshan of, who's close to Galatia? Balasa, Kircha Gopinath, Ramona. So, uh, I said, well, you, you believe in Jagannath, and said, yeah, of course. And they said, but what you're teaching in the, in the university is something quite different to believe in Jagannath. He was a little perplexed, so we had a long discussion. <laughs> and then he was uh, very, he said, oh, thank you very much. I always had this question in my mind, but I never really wanted to think about it. Now I can understand. Everything I'm teaching is wrong. <laughs> I'll tell another story. Uh, once I was distributing Life Comes From Life in Toyota, they had uh, all India, they have it once a year, the All India Science Convention, and all different scientists come and they, they read out papers and they, you know, they eat something and they chat and they chit and they go away. Uh, chit chat. So, I was going in the hostels where they were, all these different professors were put up. And uh, I met him and I asked, Who are you, what's your name? What are you doing? And he says, well, I, these days I mostly travel around the world and present papers at scientific conferences like this. And he, then he asked me, well, what are you doing? And they said, I'm distributing this book, Light Comes From Light. And he said, well, what's it about? And I said, it shows how modern evolutionary theory is all nonsense. And he laughed and he said, well, we already know that. <laughs> so I said, well, why are you still teaching it? And I said, well, we don't have any other theory. You have to teach something. <laughs> Cheating. Of course, not everyone accepts that. Many scientists do. Evolution. My grandfather was a monkey. And so on. Anyway, let's evolve to a higher level of consciousness by beginning this yagya, whatever's to be done. So, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai and evolutionary theory, hi, hi. <laughs> Definitely in the... Uh, you know, in the, they used to believe and they strongly believed that if you go far enough, if you sail far enough in your ship, then you'll fall off the edge of the world. And like Christopher Columbus, his, when his, as he was sailing off to discover, as they say, America, although there were really people there, but they weren't real people because they weren't Europeans. So they were only red Indians. So they're not counted. Anyway, as he was sailing west to discover... India, actually he was looking for India, that's why they called them Indians. Uh, his sailors almost mutinied because they thought we're sailing further and further west, we don't know where we're going. Any time we could just fall off the edge. So what do you think about that? It's a joke, isn't it? You think, how could they have been so foolish? Well, it's quite likely that 
in future people will look back and say, how did they believe that? That we all descended from monkeys. It will just sound as it will sound just as ridiculous. Prabhupada said this cheating of the scientists we finished in fifty years. He said that about thirty years ago. Let's see. You have to just read those books. They're all having their effect. And I have to finish this class, as I've said at least for the time. <laughs> Are there any real scientists here? Couldn't talk about that. Sadar Puja, he said that Origins magazine, he says.